This morning, uh, we're going to be talking about, the, every morning session, we're talking about something that is hard for us to get around as we pursue belief in Jesus. I believe, but blank. And this morning, what I want to talk to you guys about is, I believe, I want to believe, but it's hard to trust that scripture is true. It's hard to trust that the Bible is accurate. It's hard to trust that scripture actually portrays real, historical, accurate events. And so I want you to, if you're taking notes, I know that you're probably just now getting to your seat, taking out your notebooks. But if you're taking notes, we're going to take a lot of notes today. I'm going to fly through a ton of information in not a lot of time. But I want you to title this message, Why Trust Scripture? Why Trust Scripture? I'm going to address some of the main areas of this issue because if we're being honest with ourselves, this is a growing issue in our world. So many people are less inclined to trust or to believe what they're told because if we're being honest, we've been told a lot of lies. The media is not honest with us. The culture is not honest with us. We take things with a grain of salt naturally because we're so used to reading things, seeing things, and watching things that we're told are true, and yet they're not. And I'm not saying that this is a bad quality. I think it's good to be skeptical and even be critical and test what you hear. And so what I want to communicate with you this morning is I'm going to try and address a lot of these main areas, the, the issues of trusting Scripture and believing that it's real. But when it comes down to it, no amount of evidence, no amount of proof that I can provide to you is going to convince you that this book right here is the real God-breathed, living, double-edged sword that pierces our hearts, that God says it is. The only way you can be convinced of that is if you have given your life to Jesus and if the Holy Spirit lives in you. So I don't want your expectation to be when we go through all this information that if I just tell people this, they're going to believe. It can help. It can help both believers and non-believers to see that, that our faith, it's not just a, a faith that you can try and muster up or something that you go through life skeptically with. In fact, me and my friend Reese, who's on staff, we were talking about this before. That's not what faith is. Faith can actually be logical, but it's not going to prove it. It's not going to convince you. The only thing that convinces you is the presence of the Holy Spirit. But we can still look at it and see how it helps us walk through this. So, ultimately, this is an act of faith, but I want to help us as we venture through this life of doubt. In our lives and in our faith and our belief in Jesus, doubt is natural. Doubt is natural. You're, gonna, you're going to experience it. I experience it a lot. So don't be afraid and don't be ashamed that you doubt whether or not scripture is true or whether or not God is real. That's a natural thing for Christians, for mortals as humans to go through. But we are challenged to work through that with a faithful posture, asking God to help us through this doubt. We cannot stay in it. We have to ask God for help and figure out how to get through it. So I want you to open up with me to 2 Timothy 3. Starting in verse 16 and 17, we're going to look at some of the purposes of Scripture and why Scripture has been written, why it applies to us. Why do we read Scripture? Well, Paul writes in his second letter to Timothy, he says, I'm going to go ahead and start reading it. I know that some of you might not be there yet, but I don't have a ton of time, so I'm going to start reading it. It says in verse 16, all Scripture is God-breathed, and it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training and righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So we read scripture to prepare us. We read scripture to rebuke us. We read scripture to train us. We read scripture to push us forward in our relationship with Jesus. He also says, or sorry, Peter says in his second letter, in verse 1, I'm actually going to start in verse 19. It's not going to be up on the screens, but I'm going to read it. We also have the prophetic message, the scriptures, as something completely reliable. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. We're called to look at this because when the world around us is dark, we have a light right here. 
Peter says in verse 20, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So everything you read in this book, it, it was written by human hand, but it was inspired, like it says in te- 2 Timothy 3, it was inspired by God. It is God breathed. These are written by count. There are so many authors that help comprise this book. But God breathed through them to write it. And so this is the context of what we're going to be talking about today. We have a book that pushes up us forward. We have a book that trains us. And we have a book that is God breathed, written by human hands, but inspired by the Lord. But what if I still doubt? What if I still doubt? So I'm going to go through three major points, major steps in our walk through doubt. And in trying to figure out, is scripture actually reliable? The first one, you can write this down, is proof. And proof is evidence that helps us trust. Evidence that helps us trust. So in looking through scripture, there are many different areas that prove why the Bible is accurate and prove why it's reliable. And I'm going to fly through some information. There's going to be a bunch of points on the screen. And as, as good as you can do, please write them down. But there's even more than this. We could spend months, we could probably spend years talking about the evidence as to why this book is reliable and historically accurate. But I'm going to hit some of the major points. Point number one, the foolishness of the gospel. The foolishness of the gospel. So many people that are involved in cults or political movements or whatever, if they're going to make up a story or construct some sort of narrative, they're going to tell it in a way that makes them look good. Many people claim that the Bible cannot be true because the disciples and the early leaders of the church who wrote the Bible, they just wrote it to help them. They wrote it to help them politically gain more power. They wrote it so that they would become more successful and get more money. They wrote it so that people would listen to them and follow them. But in reality, this could not be farther from the truth because all throughout scripture, these leaders of the church, these apostles and these disciples, they're depicted as weak and sinful. Countless times, Peter, the first major pastor, leader of the early church, he's depicted as weak and sinful time and time again. In the Gospels, it shows that Peter denies Jesus three times right before he's taken to the cross. Jesus rebukes him and tells him, get behind me, Satan, when Peter tries to tell him, no, you will not die. Peter's not shed in a a good light. So why why would the early leaders of the church write a book that would be so counterproductive to a political scheme? Why would the early leaders of the church write a book that humbles themselves? Maybe because the story is true. Maybe because the story is not about them, it's about someone else. The main character of the story dies. (laughs) If you want to write a story, you're going to depict the the main character as this powerful, strong man or woman who's capable of doing anything. And that's exactly who Jesus is. But then we get to the end and he dies. He dies. That's super counterproductive. Nobody ever would have written something like that. All the works of the time, especially in in Greek and Roman literature, they never would have written their main character or the person that the, the story is about, their protagonist, as someone who would have died. That is the ultimate form of humility. To be humiliated in front of hundreds of people up on a cross and then die makes no sense for the story. And then he eventually resurrects But it's counterproductive if the early church wanted to try and show a story or or plant this this lie in people's heads and then say, nah, the guy that you're worshiping, he ended up dying. (laughs) That doesn't make any sense. But then he rose again and he conquered the grave and he did what nobody else could. It also uh, valued the lower class. It valued slaves. It valued women. It valued children. And at the time, there were caste systems in the early world. In Greco-Roman society, uh, a testimony of of a woman, the eyewitness account of a woman was not valued. Slaves and servants were not valued. Their lives were next to meaningless. Even children 
whether they were slave or free, were treated as the same as a slave. Yet all throughout scripture, what does Jesus do? He values the lowly. He heals the sick. He seeks out the servant. He seeks out the slave. He listens to, to the women and lifts them up. And he values children. In fact, he says, in order to enter the kingdom of, of, of heaven, of God, you have to have the faith of a child. And he welcomes them into his arms when everyone else tries to deter them. So if they were trying to, if the early church was trying to write this book that just kind of went with their own scheme, with, with their own plan, it was so counterproductive to everything that you would see in that culture. And it wouldn't have been received. It would have gone against everything that everyone believed. If you want to get people on your side, you agree with the flow. You go with the culture. But they did the exact opposite. The gospel that they preached was foolish in the eyes of, of Greeks, of Jews, and of Romans. In the eyes of everyone that would have heard it. And so it makes no sense to have a gospel like this. Second point, second slide, eyewitness testimony. Eyewitness testimony. So at the time that the Bible was written, the most reliable source, just like today, eyewitness testimony is one of the most reliable sources in a court case or in any sort of telling of a factual event. Eyewitness testimony then was valued above everything else because they didn't have cameras, they didn't have anything to record audio or visual. It was just eyewitness testimony. And you know what these, these books were written upon? Eyewitness testimony. It says at the beginning of Luke and Acts that Luke writes this gospel, writes this account of the life of Jesus from eyewitness testimonies so that anyone who may read would have certainty that the events are true. These books were written by eyewitnesses. The Gospels were written somewhere around the 40s to the 70s AD. The Pauline epistles, all of Paul's letters, were written somewhere between 45 and 60 AD. We believe that the book of Galatians might be the earliest book that he wrote. That he wrote and that might have been even in the mid-30s, right after Jesus would have passed away and then risen again. The Acts and, and general epistles were written between the 40s and the 90s AD. Every single one of these books were written while eyewitness, eyewitness accounts, eyewitness people, people that actually saw who Jesus was and what he did were still living. They weren't written by people who had never been there. They weren't written by people who had never seen who Jesus was. And even those that were written by the people who didn't witness every single event that Jesus did got their sources from people who were actually there. And so their sources were reliable. Their sources could be trusted. Their sources were hundreds of people, thousands of people that were there and said, yeah, I was there when he was crucified. I saw him when he rose again. I was one of the 500 that, that Jesus appeared to after he rose again. I saw him turn water into wine. I was at that wedding. I saw him walk on water. I was on the boat. I thought he was a ghost. I saw him raise that guy that... Uh, had been lowered on a mat through the tiles of a ceiling who could not walk. He picked up his mat and he walked away. I saw Jesus do that. There were countless eyewitness testimonies and eyewitness accounts that affirmed that these events were true and all of the books of the Bible were written within the lifetime of each of these eyewitnesses. And the random names in scripture that you see like at the end of Romans 16, all throughout the passion narrative, at the end of a lot of the epistles, there are random lists or random people that are named that may not have actually played a role. I know that's sometimes confusing for me. I'll be reading a passage and boom, there's a name. And I'm like, I don't know why they're here. <laughs> they play no role in the story. But the author of this book is including them to show, hey, go ask them. Because when they wrote it, the person was still alive. The book of Romans is filled at the end of it with a giant long list of names. And he does that to encourage the people and to say, if you're reading this letter, go ask them. They can testify that these events are true. So we have eyewitness testimony. Copies and manuscripts. So one test of reliability is the number of copies that are made or manuscripts that are made 
of some sort of historical document. The New Testament has the most copies and manuscripts of any document in its time. By far, it's not even close. It has 5,800 Greek manuscripts and copies, to over 10,000 Latin manuscripts and copies, and 9,300 other manuscripts and copies of other languages. And those are just the ones that we found to this day. The next closest of its time are Homer's Iliad and Odyssey with 1450 and 1300, respectively. That's not even close. It's like 25,000 copies of the New Testament compared to not even 3,000 of the next closest. And they tested the reliability based upon this because when people read something and knew that it was true, they knew it was valuable to copy it down and to spread the word. And over 25,000 copies and manuscripts were made. And the last one for this section is the danger of the gospel. It's not going to be up on the screens, but I, I, just want to, I just want to challenge you with this. If the gospel were a lie, if the gospel were made up, if the gospel were a cult, if Jesus wasn't truly the Messiah, if he were just a teacher or a preacher that did a couple signs and wonders, or maybe he was just a wise old rabbi, then why would he be willing to die for it? Why would the disciples be willing to die for it? Why would hundreds, thousands of Christians in the early church be willing to be thrown into the Colosseum and eaten by lions, crucified on a cross, burned alive, tarred and feathered, drugged through the streets of Rome for their faith? If it were a lie and your life was on the line, your comfort was on the line, or you were being tortured, if, if it were me, I'd be like, ha, you caught me. It was a lie, it was a joke, it was a prank. Ha, ha funny joke, I'm going to go home now. But we have church historical evidence that every single one of the disciples were killed or tortured for their faith. And if the disciples who witnessed who Jesus was firsthand for three years, if they knew that Jesus was truly not the Messiah, then they would have taken back their story in a heartbeat. But they were willing to lay down their life for it. So this is the evidence, this is the proof. But I, again, I want to tell you that this does not prove to you that this is true. Point number two, we have to practice faith. And faith is trust when certainty seems difficult. Faith is trust when certainty seems difficult. This proof, it can't convince, it can only help. We must actually choose to believe. And this cannot happen without salvation. These things cannot convince you that scripture is real. It can help. It can make it logical. It can make it reliable. But until you have given your life to Jesus and actually sit down and read the word, you will not be convinced that scripture is true. And the third point, belief. Action upon this faith. We talked last night. The third point last night was that we are not just called to believe in who Jesus is, and then believe, and then believe in what he what he did. We are called to actually act upon it. Belief is moving. Belief is acting. Belief is doing. If you believe that this book is true, that it's accurate and it's real, then read it. Read it. The more you read, the more you will believe. And that is that that is true. If you have given your life to Jesus and the Holy Spirit lives in your heart and there's a supernatural event that takes place when you open up this book and read the words on the page, that doesn't happen for people who don't know Jesus. That doesn't happen for people who don't have the Holy Spirit living in their heart. That happens for those who have been saved and renewed and made whole. Because the Holy Spirit uses the, the God-breathed words on the page to convince you that this right here is true. Luke doesn't say, I'm going to give you all these facts. I'm going to give you all these things that are reliable. I'm going to give you all of these, these numbers that will convince you that you may have certainty that the gospel is true. No, he says, I've, I've gone to eyewitness accounts, eyewitness testimonies, and I'm going to tell you about the story of Jesus Christ, and that will give you certainty. You are called to actually read the book, 
not watch a five minute YouTube video about an 18 year old who looked up a couple facts and then two minutes later was like, okay, I'm gonna show people why scripture isn't real. Many of us are tempted to believe some 25 year old on YouTube who maybe did a couple minutes of research about why scripture isn't real, but we don't trust the apologists, we don't trust the pastors, we don't trust the theologians who have spent their entire lives trying to show you and show me that this is true. We don't trust the book, the 66 books that were put together into the God-breathed word of life that for thousands of years the church has accepted, for thousands of years Christians have believed in, and for thousands of years people like you and me have read and been changed by. So stop claiming that the Bible isn't true if you don't even take the time to open it up and read it. So my challenge to you, I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna watch a video and y'all will be dismissed, but my challenge to you is read the book, read the Bible. You will be convinced that it is true, not because of the proof of the evidence that I've provided, but because of the truth of the Holy Spirit and the potency of his word. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for this book. Thank you that you've blessed us and you have not left us alone. You didn't, re, you didn't write this book to us, but you wrote it for us. And we want to be spoken to, we want to receive, and we want to believe. We believe, Lord. Help our unbelief. Help us walk through this doubt. We trust in you. We pray all this in your name. Amen.